Is there racism in hip hop? Yes, there's racism in hip hop. Like there's anything else that happens in a social environment is within hip hop. There's nothing that hip hop will not speak about because hip hop isn't shy. So you're asking me, is there racism in hip hop? Hmm. Sadly enough, in society there's racism and hip hop will reflect hip hop will reflect on what society sees. So therefore, yes, there's racism in hip hop. Also that we have to look at as much as we have to admit that there might be racists in hip hop, look how much of a unifying vehicle to bring cultures of different ethnicities together nobody's quite done that as hip-hop so even though there may be racism in hip-hop which is the question let me also bring it to your attention that hip-hop has been the biggest strongest most influential vehicle of bringing the races together so it's like i could say mm -hmm. And I'd like to add to this, is there homophobia in hip hop? Yeah. Did you say yeah? I'm just saying yeah. So you there, want to there, add to it? there's yeah. a question. Is there homophobia in hip hop? I'm sure there might be. But is there people in hip hop representing liberal minds to break down these homophobic barriers? Yes, indeed. Hmm. Um, there's a lot, um, obviously, a lot more white artists started. Um, why he's got the mic? <laughs> Go what? Obviously, a, a no, lot more white. I, I, I wanted to add something to this. Yeah, no. oh, I love it. We discussed this. We discussed, this the, <laughs> we discussed this on the. We discussed this on the radio Fizzy the other day. We, we asked this question on the radio on the debate: Is there racism hip hop? It's a broad question that like, some people answer it completely different to others, and some people spoke about um, the industry racism in, like from from record labels and people that are in in control of certain situations. Um, um, and then there was an issue of like white rappers being a white rapper being an issue and I was explaining that I never ever felt ever that being an issue for me and Mongo comment, um, sent in a comment saying where when Skinny and Chester first was coming up to open mics and stuff yeah. it was different, it was, yeah. it was, there was a lot less, less white rappers and yeah. it was an issue yeah. and um, I don't know, I don't know if you can touch on that I can absolutely touch on that, I'd be delighted um, when hip hop first started, the embodiment of hip hop, and many people often get it misconstrued about what the four elements of hip hop are. Hip hop came from a place of despair. Yeah. And it was based upon four elements of four pillars of mm. such a foundation mm. of what it was set upon. Mm. The strength of it could never be faltered mm. and it could never be destroyed. Mm. Therefore, hip hop would be forever. There's no way you could ever destroy the monument of hip-hop because the four pillars that it was birthed on yeah. is peace, love, yeah. unity and having fun. Yeah, yeah. Nobody could ever destroy that. The monument yeah. of the, the, the pillars that that monument is built on is indestructible for yeah. eternity. Yeah. Peace, love, unity yeah. and having fun. Yeah. Now, people coming from a place of despair coming to a realization of the truth of what this really means mm. gave them a new lease in life mm. and hip-hop was born yeah. and it was with blacks whites latinos spanish italians puerto ricans every culture of a lower working class that were residents of the south bronx at the time now i specifically remember a time People's old school to them might not be old school to me because, you know, I remember hip hop going through its different genres and I remember Public Enemy coming along. Yeah. And I remember I love Public Enemy. And it was at the time when I was coming politically aware of how England exercises inequalities. And I used to love spitting Public Enemy's rhymes and I was with the one where it said, um, about Farrakhan, don't tell me that you understand until you've heard the man, mm. which gave me an interest into Farrakhan. And then I heard Farrakhan and I thought, what a delightful, loving, peaceful human being that that man is, a true humanitarian in my eyes. And um, 
and he was influenced by the great honorable Elijah Muhammad another beautiful inspirational human being to grace the planet you know and um, I was very influenced by the qualities that these people had and and the love that they wanted to bring and I could see it um, undiluted and I saw that England didn't want Farrakhan to come to this country to speak and I think well England are the people that practice freedom of speech and that you should be allowed to go to Hyde Park Corner on a Sunday which is called Speaker's Corner and speak on any topic that you like in the country where they practice as the law freedom of speech and they had prohibited this man from entering the, com the country because they believed that what he was going to speak of would have incited racial hatred a couple of years later we was graced on our shores with the presence of the Honourable Chuck D from Public Enemy and I remember him giving an interview about what it meant to be to be pro-black and this was something that I wish to have an overstanding of and when I heard Chuck D break it down and he was unable to educate me on, on the meaning of what this meant he was like how is it as a black man can he not be pro for the advancement of his black people it doesn't mean that in any way he's anti-white or he's anti-asian or anything of the of the sort he believes that the white man should be pro-white the black man should be pro-black the, the Chinese man should be pro-Chinese that we should all be and I said well I like pro for everybody so maybe that makes me a pro-humanitarian and I realized that what that means is I'm all for pro-black I'm all for pro-white I'm for pro-everything I'm for pro-humanitarianism <laughs> I don't like isms or schisms so just pro, pro I'm a pro-humanitarian and it, and it let me know that it broke down racial barriers I can say that in that time a lot of my Caucasian friends who were heavily influenced with hip-hop as a movement and as a culture from the birth almost felt that there wasn't a place for them because it had almost become a voice for impoverished black communities to vent their angst and that would be inadequate to them because that's not their social background yeah um, so maybe that's where hip-hop lost a lot of its white audience because of people's own shallow ignorance if people were a bit open-minded more to learn more and understand diverse cultures more maybe they wouldn't fear them as much maybe they'd even find that you know they're wonderful and splendid to rejoice in worldly cultures um, I used to often get asked why do you speak the way you do because of the environment that I was raised in so, and not only the environment that I was raised in if I was raised in Paris I'm sure I'd have a French accent if I was raised in Scotland I'm sure I'd have a Scottish accent and I've over the years tried to learn how to articulate myself in the best possible manner for a wider audience of listeners not just the youths that are on road that speak in slang the way that I'm fluent I've tried to broaden my vocabulary to be able to reach a wider audience um, I want us all to have a universal language so we can all understand each other perfectly clear with no misconceptions, misconstrued so when I look at the barriers that are created to segregate everyone in every differentiation I look at let's look at our common similarities so when it comes to me being influenced the way that I've been influenced and raised the way that I've been raised and people wanting to question the authenticity of who I am as a person because I've been engrossed in dance hall music I've actually thought well that's the way I was raised but alternatively there's nothing wrong or I don't personally see anything wrong with people embracing culture the first time that I can say I ever experienced such a thing and notice such a thing of someone adopting another culture because they love the culture and their love for the culture was a boy who was a neighbor who was engrossed in Italian football and he was so engrossed in Italian football he learned to speak Italian and then he became so engrossed with Italian culture he learned to cook pasta and lasagna etc and he finds 
Italian culture so beautiful that he goes to Ita Italy and has holidays there uh, and he loves it. It's like, you know, he has a lust and a passion for Italian culture. So it was the first time I ever saw it and I thought it was weird at the time, like, right, just free football and your love for Italian football. You've learned to speak Italian, you can cook Italian pasta, you go on Italy on holiday now and, you know, it was amazing. But, you know, who's to say that someone shouldn't do that? I'm sure he found much joy in it and yeah. and for anybody finding happiness in something, I'm not here to tell people that they shouldn't pursue happiness. I believe that people should pursue happiness. <laughs> you talked about um, how people, how you wanted to understand the culture of like what you heard um, Public Enemy speak about and speakers are important to them and you want to learn about them. Um, I guess that's a difference between immersing yourself in a culture and like um, taking it somewhere else, like cultural appropriation, I suppose you could call it. Do you think that, um, someone who used the term whitewash, do you think that, that hip hop has been whitewashed? That's in the sense that it's been taken away and it's been taken somewhere else or that people are involved in it without that understanding or without taking or without giving respect to to its roots i understand that question perfectly and i think what we'll call it um is industrialized and i'm sure when beethoven presented his first ever symphonies they would have said what kind of madness is this we're not getting behind it now that we call it classical music you've got worldly music scholars that swear by it. So it's become industrialized in the industry. And then if we look at what industrialism means, if we look at somebody like Chuck Berry in the 60s, Elvis Presley, they would have seen a music that they shunned as devil music, which was rock and roll. And then said, one minute, this actually might be a great marketing strategy to help us sell Coca-Cola, for instance. So now, who better to get a person of influence to a youth culture of a market that we're trying to exploit with our brand than somebody who they look up to musically? How's about get that person to do a music jingle for our brand? I think that how the industrialization of the industry has evolved has made young musicians who would have wanted to solely concentrate on their artistic integrity have to become business moguls. I often express this in a formula of David Beckham being a brand and the Beckhams being a brand. It was in Beckham's career that I first realized there's a football player getting paid more off the pitch than he is on the pitch because of the way that he's branding and marketing. Now I'm sure people have always been exploited by the industry to help create marketing sales. And when we look at what we have as the evolution of the industrialization of music being the vehicle, we have people like Rick Ross releasing his own brand of alcohol. Um, you know, Puff Daddy, the Chiroc Boys and so now what we have is we have the artist realizing his own potential to cash in on himself as the industrial machine that can now bring marketing to a platform through the music audience. And now this is very savvy of an artist to exploit avenues of industrialization through their music. I mean, do you think that's selling out? It depends on your standpoint. I have my own integrity and I'd say that there's some things I'd consider to be selling out. If you're for a minute, um, if you're for one minute, um, gonna compromise your integrity, you're selling out immediately. And, and that's from the jump before you've even earned a buck. If your intention from the start was mm. to compromise your integrity, you've sold out. I believe that if you don't compromise your integrity, none whatsoever, 
and you become major successful from that, you're not selling out. And I suppose there's, what's your ethos? I remember back in the day, there used to be some incredible rappers that I thought were great, and I'd go backstage to meet them, and maybe turned out that their personality isn't so great as their music would have you believe. So, as a young aspiring rap fan, looking up to these people and idolize them in somewhat sense, my dreams were crushed and the illusions were crushed. Um, and then some people lived right up to the dream and then some, you know? Uh, and I was like, yeah, these are my heroes. So if we look at, I used to really look up to Ra Kimala and the fact that his name was Ra Kimala, you know, represented a, a, a deeper meaning of a higher calling. And I see him in rap pages doing an advertisement for Colt 45 beer. And I understand that in the Islamic culture to be haram. And I thought, did Rakim Allah compromise on his religious beliefs for the sake of the dollar bill? And it made me question authenticity of artist's integrity because I've seen a lot of artists since then preach one thing, but then in their actions be totally hypocritical to what they're preaching. Mm -hmm. And I'd say then there's a hard place to draw the line because I think about in this instance, Zach De La Roche from Rage Against the Machine, who in hand never wanted to sell out with the solid beliefs of being against the corporate machine and he in himself be became a success for the corporate machine. Mm. So his success made him a hypocrite to his ethos. And mm. I can't actually blame him mm. because he's still stuck to his ethos. Mm -hmm. Although from a different standpoint of view, he was excess for the same machine he was the rage against. Mm. I often see places like Foot Locker and JD Sports selling Che Guevara t-shirts mm. and I think Che Guevara's whole sentiment of his old ethos stood against everything that JD Sports or Foot Locker is mm. but they're selling Che Guevara t-shirts in JD Sports and Foot Locker who gets the royalty off this image you know like when they manipulate an image of Bob Marley mm. again back to the manipulation of the industrialization when they're selling a Bob Marley t-shirt who's really getting paid off that Bob Marley t-shirt mm. Is it going back to the Bob Marley Foundation? Yeah. You know? Do you think that they have a responsibility to speak on black issues? And like often they're criticised for not. So like Iggy Azalea has been criticised for not speaking out on black issues. Again, where your standpoint is, I think if I understand the question that you're asking me, you're saying the humans have a right to speak about humans. Um, sh sh should they feel responsible? Do they have a responsibility? They're involved in a culture um, that, c that came from in a black culture and they're okay, profit, okay. if they're benefiting it from it okay. or enjoying it, do they have a responsibility to also care about issues that affect the black community that don't necessarily affect them? I'd say when it comes to human responsibility, for humans to respond to be responsible for human responsibility i mean that's a romantic idealism that my heart longs to see become a reality and i'm not just talking about within music mm -hmm. i'm talking about humans caring about humans and i think what we're talking about is do i believe there's humans responsibility to care for humans and even though it's not anybody's responsibility to be forced to do something that they don't wish to do, it is my heart's romantic desire to see it one day become a reality for humans to be responsible for each other and caring for each other. So it's something that I would like to see become a reality that humans are responsible for other humans in desperate need, in help, in situations. Maybe I'm just an old fool, you know? But I believe that, you know, if everybody cared for everybody, 
when, if everybody was there to make sure everybody's all right, when someone ain't all right, we're all here to make sure you are all right. And I believe that if everybody in the world was like abiding by this quality that we easily possess, then everybody would be all right. Because the minute someone's not, we're all here to make sure you are. And I believe that that's economically, um, you know, f for the basic necessities, food, clothes, shelter, education, um, medical facilities. And do we include compassion into this, you know? care and compassion because even like people disregard care and compassion as a necessity as a basic necessity but in my thinking it is a basic necessity mm. so you know not only do we need food clothes and shelter we need education medical facilities and we need care and compassion also mm. and and i would love it myself for everybody to be responsible for everybody because we would all be alright but that is only a romantic idealism that's a view of my heart and the next man who's like skinny you're talking rubbish and I've got to do for mine right now in this current climate of, of economical devastation I can only but respect his way of thinking mm. he can might respect or not respect my way of thinking but I do respect that for his reality of his situation and for many people around the world right now might be in a position where they think that we can't make the um, transition. Mm. I believe that the humans are like, how do we make this transition to start caring about ourselves? I know that a lot of the world probably share the romantic idealism that I share. But it's how do we administrate this into practice? Mm. And how do we lay down our tools to make the transition? So maybe if we all start, like you say, in the question, take it as our responsibility to care for other humans, this romantic idealism might become a reality, maybe even in my lifetime.